Welcome back to Startups for the Rest of Us. This week, I'm your host, Rob Walling. In fact, every week on this show, I walk through topics related to building and growing startups using an ambitious yet a sustainable approach. We're not willing to sacrifice our health or relationships to grow our companies, but at the same time, we want to build real businesses with real customers who pay us real money. We value things like being meticulous and being disciplined and having a process that's repeatable and not relying on so much luck or a one in a thousand chance to build a business that can change our lives or the lives of those around us. We know that starting a company is hard and that more than half of being a startup founder is managing your own psychology, as well as making hard decisions with incomplete information where the right answer is impossible to find through math or data. It's great to have you back. Thanks again for joining me this week. I am flying solo this week, a Rob solo adventure, as I like to call him. And I'm going to bounce through a few topics that have been on my mind recently. I've used these solo episodes almost as ways to communicate things that would 10 years ago I would have put in a blog post. But now I like to put them in the podcast and potentially turn them into a Twitter thread at some point. And someday, if I have more time, I would love for each of these to be a blog post. So one thing I want to cover is something I've covered briefly, danced around it on Q&A episodes, but it's around hiring folks with different mindsets. And most specifically, I need to think of a, of a good name for this, but I, I think of it as a task level thinker, project level thinkers, and owner level thinkers. And back in the day when I was hiring virtual assistants, you know, I was fresh off the four hour work week. This is what, 2007 or eight. I realized I could try to replace myself by hiring $5 an hour virtual assistant in the Philippines. And they were very much task level thinkers. And I would record a screencast and it would take me, you know, 30 minutes to upload it to to a website and then send it to them. This is before Loom and all those things. But I could outsource some, I guess, some rudimentary, truly just repeatable tasks, almost things you could you could almost automate with code, but maybe they would take you too long to do or things that were just easy to throw into Google Doc or a screencast. And so for years, I operated with task level thinkers and I was happy as a basically a solopreneur with seven or eight. I think I actually peaked at nine contractors who were helping me. This is different, you know, folks who were doing design work, folks who were um, doing administration, folks who were doing email support, developers. And it was like, all right, here's your next task. Take care of this. But what I realized is I was then doing all the owner level thinking, which was longer term stuff, and the project level thinking, which was, okay, this project needs, it was project management, right? It's like this project needs seven things to happen. So now I get to manage all those people. And that was fine when I was small. That was fine before I wanted to grow, you know, multi million dollar company. But there was a turning point for me, let's say it was around 2010, 2011, where I hired a couple people who were more project level thinkers. And they themselves, I could hand an entire project and they would then either manage the resources for me or they would just, they could do the whole thing themselves because they were essentially full stack employees, you know, where they, that's a developer term. I think most of you know it, but it's someone who can, who can design and who can code and they can do database work and maybe even DevOps work, but it's someone who has a, a multitude of skills. And that's when I realized, oh, this is the achievement that, that I've unlocked here. And this is why when folks do raise a lot of funding, they will hire individual contributors, you know, who you could say, well, they're thinking about their own task, but you'll also, you're able to afford project level thinkers, which I was not able to afford prior to that point because I never had a business that generated enough income. And then beyond that, after we were acquired, you know, when we sold Drip in 2016, I started seeing folks working inside a company who were not the C-suite, and they were not owners, they were not founders of the company, but they really owned an entire segment and they thought creatively around it. And so, you know, someone who was like a marketing strategist who ran this whole team of people, he wasn't just thinking about projects. Actually, each of his people had their own projects, but he was thinking long-term, what do we need to do 12 to 18 months, coming up with new ideas, uh, you know, listening to the audio books, listening to the podcast, reading the books, and being what I call an owner level thinker, where it's not about the equity that he owned, but it was about ownership of the results, soup to nuts, from the vision to the implementation and working with the team to do it. And so task level, project level, and owner level thinkers are how I now classify it in my head. That's my mental framework. And the hard part is, of course, we want all owner level thinkers. These are senior level people who can get a lot of things done, but they're very expensive. They tend to be A, hard to find, and B, out of you know the price range of a lot of bootstrappers. You know, you're, if you're going to hire a contractor or someone who's going to work for you part time, 
I haven't seen that work. Actually, I've seen it work in a couple instances, but it's very rare. And, you know, in general, I think these roles need to be thought about more, more full time. And, you know, I, I saw it again in the latter days of Drip when we had funding. And then, of course, with Tiny Seed these days, you know, I get this question, Rob, you work on so much, you're working on Tiny Seed and MicroConf and a podcast and you do other stuff on the side. I hear you're working on a book or whatever. How do you do all that? And the secret really is that we have a great team and that I don't actually implement most of what happens with MicroConf because producer Xander, who's been on the show and you should follow him at producer Xander on Twitter. He is that owner level thinker of MicroConf. And he and I, I would say, share that role in essence, where we are both thinking about the vision and the brand and the long term. And then we start getting to the short term and the day to day. And then producer Xander is able to go off and implement and be a project level thinker. And then even, you know, get into the nitty gritty of it and be a task level thinker and, and be that individual contributor who, who grinds it out and, and gets the tasks done. And the same thing on the tiny seed side with Tracy Osborne, who is the program director of Tiny Seed. And she not only keeps the trains running on time, but she's not just thinking about how can I run this accelerator batch or this next month or two, but, you know, in conjunction with Anar and I, we're all thinking, well, what do we need to do to make improvements? And what does this look like a year from now? What does this look like five years from now? And really, what does it look like when we're running multiple batches in parallel? There's just a lot of things to be thinking about. And it's great to have someone who is committed to it and is thinking about it at that high level ownership level. And again, it's ownership of, you know, the results of, of wanting this to be successful. And Tracy, I mean, you've heard around the, this podcast many times. She's at Tracy Makes on Twitter if you want to follow her. And so that's that's really where I'm at in terms of a mental framework is that having moved from hiring task level thinkers $5 an hour in the Philippines to project level thinkers and then you know being able to to work with owner level thinkers which is really senior people is how you would you know I think in the in the Silicon Valley parlance it's just really senior folks who can drive entire efforts and and both see strategy and tactics and get things done in the early days and then hire people to get things done and manage them and you know, there's a lot of skill set and so those are my up to date thoughts on hiring. And what's interesting is until you've worked with or hired a project or owner level thinker, you usually think they don't exist. Oftentimes they, again, they are not cheap. When I think of inexpensive, oh, $5 an hour, it's a $30 an hour contract or something, you know, these folks require more budget, you know, and, and often funding to hire them, but it's the way that, that you can often move faster and grow a bigger you know, organization if that's something that, that you need to do or want to do. My second topic for today is around this idea of an autopilot business or a business that you run on the side and don't pay any attention to you and it just generates income forever. And I want to go on record saying there is no such thing. There is no such thing. And now you can have an autopilot business for six months, 12 months, maybe 18 months, but eventually... This is both from my direct experience where I used to have, I think it was about a dozen small apps that did between 1,000 and 10,000 a month usually. And they all combined to make you know more than a full-time income for me. So I had a bunch of those and I was trying to manage them all at once. And this is also the experience of folks that I see, MicroConf and you know even, even folks who apply for Tiny Seed or who I've talked to on this podcast. But there's this, this sentiment where I've seen someone post a business for sale of like, it's doing 10 grand a month. I want to sell it for this. You know, I spend an hour a month on it or an hour a week. And there's always someone who chimes in, well, if it's doing 10 grand a month and you're only spending an hour a week, why not just keep it forever? And the answer is because it's not going to generate revenue forever on one hour a week. It's, it's in a maintenance mode. And what will ultimately happen is a competitor will come up and eat your lunch or the organic rankings that you have in Google or YouTube or the App Store or Amazon or whatever will go away and you'll lose your traffic overnight or your ads that you're running will stop working and you'll have to dive back in or an API you're connected to and relying on will change or go out of business or quintuple their prices. Things change. In this world, in, the, in this tech world that we live in, things change. And that's why I always say you can have an autopilot business for about 12 to 18 months has been my rule of thumb. And again, I could probably name five examples of my own where this has happened, where the, the Google ranking stopped working, the Google ads stopped working, the API broke, a competitor came into the space, started eating my lunch because I wasn't paying attention to it because I was focused on drip instead of my previous efforts. 
And so I'm not saying you should never strive to have something that generates passive, quote unquote, passive income and be an autopilot business. What I am saying is don't delude yourself into thinking that you will be able to put something on the side and just have it running for years and years and years generating income without you being involved or without an owner level thinker driving it. If you just have folks doing task level and maybe project level you know, work and you have your leads coming in and you have you know, money coming in and such, that will work for a bit. But the odds of that going more than 12 to 18 months, assuming you, I mean, you know, look, if you have a dry cleaner or a grocery store, that's, that's not what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about a tech business, a software business, something that, that uses a website to generate leads usually, and something that is in a space like ours that, that is, you know, pretty rapidly evolving. And I'm mostly thinking about, you know, businesses that generate between 500 a month and I don't know, maybe up, upwards of 40K a month or 50K, you know, some, some range in that. I think at a certain point, if you have a five, $10 million business, yes, you can, you can hire a CEO, you know, again, an owner level thinker who maybe can run the business as good as you can or better. And in that case, okay, this is no longer autopilot. You've replaced yourself with a GM or a CEO. But what I, I'm really talking about these businesses like, hey, this is a software product doing five grand a month and it just kind of sells automatically because of these channels that it's coming, you know, that are coming in. The Shopify add-on I built, this, uh, you know, Heroku add-on I built. A lot of these are step one businesses, although, you know, others I have seen people try to keep on the side and be unwilling to sell it because it's like, well, it's still generating so much income. And, and once I sell it, I have this money in, in the bank it's, that I'm essentially drawing down and I get it. It's a hard decision, right? It's a hard decision to let that go and let the income go. But what I'll say is then be prepared for every six to 18 months, 12 to 18 months to be drawn back into that business. And you're going to get drawn back in because the business is going to start to decline. And that of course is the hard time. You're not going to get drawn back in to like tweak something or optimize the SEO. You're going to get brought back in because your traffic got cut in half or your revenue got cut in half or a key component of the business is failing, whether it's an API or maybe a long time, you know, a virtual assistant, a developer, an employee, like someone decides that, that it's time for a change for them. And it's tough. So I, I guess the bottom line is, again, I'm not saying don't do autopilot businesses. I had them. They were great. They just all had a lifespan. And that is a reason that as I started moving on to larger efforts, like I moved on to Hittail, I moved on to Drip, that I either shut down or I sold those at a certain point. Now, some of them I held on to too long and I thought, oh, this is autopilot and the income's so great. And then they did get crushed by Google and I didn't have the focus, didn't have the time to go back. And other ones I was smart enough, you know, at least looking back, I was smart enough to get rid of them and get the cash to then invest into my future efforts. And both approaches are okay. Keeping them around for income for a while, um, if you play it right, I don't think that's a bad call. But again, just realize that there are, there are trade-offs here that you will get pulled back into the business and be mentally prepared for that. That was always a big struggle for me is if I was focused on something, I had a really hard time going backwards and looking at, you know, this quote unquote old, old business. And it was a business that made me super happy three or four years earlier, but which I had kind of, uh, you know, gotten over. But this is why I think it's great that there is now this whole ecosystem around reselling apps. You know, we have from FE International to Quiet Light Brokerage, Empire Flippers, and then we have Micro Acquire. There are ways to get value out of an app you've built if it has revenue. And this was not really the case 10, 12 years ago where I would buy an app at 18 months net profit. I mean, it was crazy. And to try to sell it for even two years was was not easy. And obviously the multiples, you've heard me talk about them on this show, are much higher for the types of products we build. And so that is, I think, a real benefit to those of us who do build businesses and and either hit a point where they plateau and you know maybe we lose interest or maybe we do need an influx of cash or maybe we want to move on to our next effort. At least these days we can get some type of reasonable compensation for, for these companies that we've built. Hey, this is Rob dropping in from a separate time and space to talk to you about Rewardful. Everyone knows it's hard to grow an online business, especially in the early days. People are becoming desensitized to content marketing and paid advertisements. Instead, they're turning to product recommendations from people they trust. So how do you cut through the noise and grow through word of mouth? This is where Rewardful comes in. Rewardful has everything you need to start referral marketing for your SaaS, membership, or e-commerce business. Reward your advocates whenever they send you paying customers. Rewardful is specifically built to work with Stripe and automatically handles one-time charges, free trials, 
upgrades, downgrades, cancellations, and refunds. They can even help you find and recruit relevant affiliates for your industry. Companies like Transistor, Podia, and Bear Metrics trust Rewardful to power their affiliate programs and scale with their growth. Spencer Fry from Podia says, every other affiliate platform we looked at was either insanely expensive or full of bugs, and sometimes both. Rewardful has been rock solid, took less than 15 minutes to install. It's the perfect affiliate solution for SaaS companies using Stripe. So whether you're looking to start an affiliate program, partner program, customer referral program, or all the above, Rewardful lets you manage everything under one roof with a simple 15-minute integration. Get 30% off your first three months by heading to getrewardful.com slash startups. That's getrewardful.com slash startups. Offer expires May 31st. My third topic is around two books I read recently. One is called Billion Dollar Loser, and it's the story of WeWork. The other is Invent and Wander, which is, it says, it's essays from Jeff Bezos. It's his shareholder letters, which are, I'll say, not super interesting. But then there's an interview at the end that I found was pretty fascinating, or it was excerpts from interviews. And so overall, I don't recommend Invent and Wander as a read, but it was interesting for me to, to read both of these books. And Bill and Dollar Loser, I do, I would recommend if you want to be really angry <laughs> at, at just the stupidity and, and this whole charismatic founder who convinces, you know, one person to give him a bunch of money and continues to just, everyone, the press is saying, this isn't going to work. It's just real estate. And you know, it's, it's a new way of doing things. I, this stuff is infuriating. It's infuriating to me that people fall for this. So with that said, I struggled with both these books and it was interesting as I listened to it because... Adam, who is the founder of WeWork, is he was like dating Gwyneth Paltrow's cousin. And like when he needed his early money, he had these contacts in New York. And then he borrowed a million dollars from like his girlfriend's parents to like buy their first building. And I I just couldn't relate to that. Like I didn't, I, I struggle with stories like this where it's like, yes, he built something that wound up, wound up being worth something, but like he didn't start where the rest of us did. And the same thing with Bezos, which I don't know that I had realized, but he mentions, you know, when I was at Princeton and blah, blah, blah. And instantly I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah, I went to public university in, in, uh, in California, University of California, Davis. And it was like, I don't even remember, three, $4,000 a year, you know, what I attended. And, and that was it. And there were 25,000 people there. And I went there to get an education. But I, I, didn't, I didn't go to Princeton. You know, I didn't go to Harvard. And he talks about it, like my parents were my first investors. And they took out a bunch of money to, you know, make Amazon go. And again, unrelatable friends and family rounds. I always shrug my shoulders. It's like, I didn't have friends or family with money, you know, when I went to start things. And I had to work a day job making 17 bucks an hour. And then I, you know, was teaching myself modern programming because I had graduated from public university without, you know, everything was 10 or 15 years behind. And so I was checking out books at the library to learn Perl and HTML because we didn't learn web stuff. And so I guess all that to say, this is why I like our community, the bootstrapped, mostly bootstrapped, microconf founder community that really is people coming together with a desire to build ambitious things, to provide value to the world, to change their life through, frankly, raising themselves up from making four fifty an hour at their first job or coming from a public school or not even going to college. And it just matters so much less in our circles. And I'm really thankful for that. I mentioned this in an outro of, of an episode the other day, but in case you didn't hear it, there was a study published, in, and I forget the exact numbers, but it was like 80% of venture capital, it might even be 90% of venture capital in any given year goes to, to people who have attended Harvard or Stanford. And I was curious in that in Tiny Seed, we've now done, you know, three batches of companies, 41 companies we've invested in. And I posted, I'm curious, has did anyone here go to Harvard or Stanford? And I was like, no criticism. If you did, I'm just curious out of all the founders that we have. And I don't even know what the founder count is now. It's probably north of 70, if I were to guess. And, and then I said, you know, I went to a public university and a public high school, you know, in a public grammar school in, in junior high. And people were weighing in and, and laughing. Like, no, I went to like this junior college or like I didn't even go to college. Or, you know, it was all these things of like, this I think is why people start talk about startups, founding startups being a meritocracy. And while I do see insiders 
making it like Jason Calcanis is a good example. Like I like the fact that he was from Brooklyn and like didn't know anybody and just hustled and he became a journalist and then an investor and a founder. And I just have a lot of respect for what he's built. And you know, you can like him or you can not like him. You can agree with him or not, but he's worked really hard and built himself a pretty incredible life. And I, and I admire that about him and other folks who have done that and truly did it without going to Princeton, having your parents as the first investors, you know, traveling in circles with Gwyneth Paltrow and borrowing a million dollars from your girlfriend's parents. And am I saying that these folks at Jeff Bezos or Adam, they don't deserve it, they didn't work as hard, that they shouldn't have used those things? Of course not. Use every advantage you have. But I did find myself struggling with the stories of the early days of WeWork and Amazon. I struggled to relate to them because I've never been in those situations and I've never had the advantages that they have. And I'm guessing if you're listening to this podcast, that might resonate with you as well. So I like this community. I love being a part of it. And frankly, I'm, I'm glad you're here as well. You know, I hope that this podcast or microconfort, just something that I've worked on or touched over the years has been an inspiration to you enough that you are able to hopefully in the long term change your life, but in the short term, just keep going and just keep putting one foot in front of the other and using whatever advantages you have to get that product off the ground, to get that next customer, to make the next sales call, to do the next sales demo, to ship that next line of code and to build a business that brings you freedom, purpose, and allows you to maintain healthy relationships. My fourth and final topic for the day is a question I think you should ask yourself as you're building, launching, and growing your company. I think so much of being a successful founder is knowing yourself. And I think a question that took me a really long time to answer, and in fact is still in flux, and maybe for a lot of you, but it's in terms of getting your app off the ground, getting your company launched, getting traction. And the question is, what are you really good at? What are you naturally gifted at? Or what do you really want to get better at? And something that you find yourself drawn towards and that other people often say, wow, that's really hard, but you're exceptionally good at this. And I want to say that in terms of shipping software, of course, being a developer, a good developer counts, but in terms of building a business, unfortunately, it kind of, it doesn't count for this question because there are a lot of good developers who can write code and ship code. And there are even a lot of good, I'll say developers and, you know, UX folks who can ship a good product. So being good at product, I'm going to, let's set that aside. What are you good at aside from that? And I want to give you a few examples. You may know Matt Wensing. You've seen him on Twitter. He's a Tiny Seed Batch 1 founder, and he is working on Summit. That's a Use Summit on Twitter and usesummit.com. As I've watched Matt build and ship and iterate and even evolve his product, what he seems to be really good at is connecting with other people, networking, and building relationships. And he's a developer, day-to-day, writing code. He came on this podcast and said, I don't love doing sales, but I'm good at it. He's good at having conversations about partnerships. I mean, he's, he's a phenomenal business development guy. He came to one microconf and he met all the people that he needed to, you know, he wanted to integrate Summit with. It was, uh, I think it was like Bear Metrics and ProfitWell. I guess there's no one from Chart Mogul there, but he didn't even ask me for intros. I knew these people. He, I think, just went up and started building relationships. And then suddenly they had integrations and they were co-promoting. That is a superpower. And it's a superpower I don't have. But some people do. And if that's you, you should take advantage of every advantage you have and therefore set yourself up for success by getting into a space where business development, enterprise sales, partnerships, and networking can be an exponential driver to the business. Because if you go into something where it's all SEO and Facebook ads and you're selling for $10, $20 a month, I guess business development could still send you, you know, you could do partnerships and affiliates. There are ways to do it, but it'll be a real exponential driver if you have, you know, larger contracts. There are just certain spaces where it really makes sense. Another example is Ruben Gomez, who has been on this podcast several times, but he's building DocSketch and he's Tiny Seed Batch 2 founder. And he's good at building, managing teams. He's good at a lot of stuff. He's good at all the stuff, but he's really figured out marketing. And as a developer who taught himself how to market 10, 12 years ago, he has really doubled and tripled down on SEO. And so when he went to start, he, you know, he still runs BidSketch, but went to start his other app, which is again, DocSketch, electronic signature, he was looking for a space with massive keyword volume and less worried about the difficulty because he knew that that was a superpower that he had developed and he had built and thus wanted to get into a space where that would have massive exponential upside for his business. 
there are all kinds of things you can be good at. You can be good at building an audience. You can be great at having stage presence and and maybe building a, a podcast following, being on YouTube, public speaking. Maybe you're a great writer and it's going to be a big content marketing and SEO play. Or maybe you have skills that don't translate to SaaS apps and maybe you don't go that route at all. You know, maybe that becomes, maybe you decide to launch courses or you decide to, you know, th- there are other ways to use your gifts. But if you're great at doing webinars and being on camera, then I would lean heavily towards getting into a space where doing webinars and getting on camera and doing conference talks are going to exponentially move the needle. This is something that took me way too long to realize and recognize in myself. And so I I think a lot of these solo adventures, when I have frameworks or make points, I'm talking to myself from five or six years ago. And to cap off this topic, of course, I will name the exception that proves the rule, and it is Derek Reimer, who is building Savvy Cal, and Derek is exceptional at product. He can design, he can build, he ships features like a team of five people. If you look at how often he's shipping things, it's amazing. You could say his gift is building in public. He's developed that. He obviously has developed an audience on the Art of Product podcast with Ben Orenstein. So you could say he's good on the mic. He developed that. I mean, if you go ask him, he wasn't good at it when he first started. He was very nervous about it. But he's someone who is so far off the charts in terms of his ability to not only write code, but to design amazing features and to ship the right things at the right time and build them quickly as a, as a one-person team, that he is using that to his advantage by competing in a space with a number of large competitors and essentially using his velocity to outmaneuver them, and then hiring out the things that maybe are not his core gifting. And, you know, as as you probably know, he's hired Corey Haynes, who is helping him with all the marketing efforts these days. And they're obviously seeing positive results from the efforts from both Derek's ability to ship features quickly and, you know, Corey on the marketing side. So to put a bow on that, so much of being a successful entrepreneur is knowing yourself. And I do think it's worthwhile asking yourself the question, what are you really, really good at? And then looking at building products that can exponentially benefit from that unique skill set. This is the final week of our Rewardful sponsorship. I really want to thank Rewardful for supporting Startups for the Rest of Us and supporting independent SaaS founders. We haven't had many sponsors of the show, and it's not something I plan to do every month, but... Sometimes there's just a really good fit and it makes a lot of sense to do it and it helps us have budget to continue with the transcripts. And, and you may have seen us putting more effort into social media and to video clips and you know all that takes time and money. And so it is helpful to have support from companies like Rewardful. As a reminder, Rewardful has everything you need to start referral marketing for your SaaS, your membership, or e-commerce business. You can get 30% off your first three months by heading to getrewardful.com slash startups. The offer expires in just a few days, May 31st, and I'd like to roll their final ad spot here. As a reminder, today's episode was brought to you by Rewardful. Rewardful is quickly becoming the go-to platform to set up affiliate, referral, and partner programs for your SaaS, membership, or subscription business. Rewardful handles all subscription billing scenarios such as free trials, upgrades, downgrades, cancellations, refunds, and prorated charges out of the box with their simple 15-minute setup. They're the only platform that has a built-in affiliate finder that crawls the web and surfaces high-quality relevant affiliates for your program. Simply search by keyword, competitor, or alternative names and reach out to the best affiliates in your market to take your program to the next level. Check them out at getrewardful.com slash startups. That's getrewardful.com slash startups to get 30% off your first three months. Offer expires May 31st. Thank you so much for joining me once again for this Rob solo adventure. I'll be back next week in your earbuds with our regularly scheduled program, probably a conversation with an interesting founder, maybe a bootstrapper news roundtable. I'm really enjoying the variety of the show these days, and I hope you are too. So I'll be back in your buds again next Tuesday morning.